following program is a stereo presentation of WYES-TV New Orleans. The following program is underwritten by the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. The fund invests nationwide in programs to encourage people to make the arts an active part of their everyday lives. bicycle one day and I learned that I could take my finger and, and patch on that bicycle it got scant I could do it better with my finger and I could with a brush and one day I put some white paint on my finger to, to patch a fender I believe it was and I looked at that face and there's a human face in that finger and that paint the eyes and everything it just spoke to me it paints sacred art and I said to it I can't do that professional can but not me and it come to me how do you know how do you know how do you know how do you know and I think to myself how do I know and so I just took a dollar bill out of my bill pole, taped it on a piece of plywood, and went out in front of my bicycle shop and started drawing, drawing George Washington off of, that, off of that dollar bill. When I got down real sick that I couldn't take care of my kids, I went to God because he was the only person that I know that I could talk to that would give me the answers that I needed. And so I asked him to give me a a talent that no one had. And I told him I would be I would be honest in it, I would be disciplined in it, I would go as far as I could go with it, and I wouldn't play no games in it for nobody. And that next morning I woke up, I had ten dollars in my pocket, and that was the gift from God to me. And that's why I say I'm the tin man. I, that was a new name for me. The whole thing was just solid. I mean I couldn't override it. I said, oh ain't no way for me to override this. And I stuck with that, and my belief is still in it. If I couldn't paint, I'd, I'd be, I'd just be lost. I don't believe I'd live long. I believe I'd just die. Out. If I couldn't, if I couldn't paint nothing, I just, I, I, I got to be one and paint something. Else. I paint something all the time. These are artists, self-taught artists self-taught Southern artists. Many self-taught artists don't even call themselves artists. They don't know other artists, and few have ever visited a museum. They've never studied painting or sculpture in art schools or universities. They don't care about the difference between a color wheel and a wagon wheel. Self-taught artists know no geographic boundaries. They exist regionally, nationally, and internationally. But in the rich soil of the South, they have flourished over the past 50 years. Most of these artists grew up in the rural South, isolated and impoverished. After World War II, the mechanization of farming forced many field hands into towns and cities. The urbanization of the Southern landscape had begun. These artists don't live and work in the great urban art centers of the world. You'll find them in places like Fayette, Alabama, and Somerville, Georgia. Wherever they were, what they saw is what they painted. The limited range of their traveled world is no handicap to the creative mind of the self-taught artist. <laughs> Between the seasonal slow periods of farm life and time between their chores, many self-taught artists have produced their works from materials that were close at hand. They learned to make do with what was available. These materials are often considered unusual and unconventional for traditional artists. Jimmy Lee Sutter 
uses his fingers in mud mixed with sugar or Coca-Cola to paint images of the world around him in Fayette, Alabama. He gonna look like a hog in a few minutes. See, this is good mud here. And I love to do mud, I love to work in mud. See, you 36 different colors a day. 36 different colors a day. What I know now, the blue, red, you know, black, brown, like I got on the picture here. When I first started, I was three years old. My mother's out hunting, her name is Bad Roller, and she's out hunting some medicine, she's a medicine lady, you know, and I, and I, I thought I'd go work on the side, so, and I pick up my little mud, and the old mud hole where the, where the wagon's been going through, and I put it on top of, on, on the side of a tree, and I like it, and I go back there and look, it'd still be up there. You see that now? He's he going to be a hog now, I guess, when I get it done. He want a fat hog. <laughs> and he want a curvy, a curvy tail. I always paint my face. When I'm back down, I wasn't able to get no brush or nothing. And so I found out I could paint with my fingers. So I just took my finger and went to painting with it. I don't know where out. Brush will wear out. <laughs> it will wear out. He wants a straight back, a big fat hog. He didn't want to frame that by quick. See this. Where are my green weeds? Hog sitting in the pasture with a lot of grass around it. See the grass? Got a little mud in there. Don't mean nobody. And a snake about to bite him. Caught to there. Look at that. How you get that mud over here? See that green in there now? All right. Now these, these, are, these are blooms here, which I know will make the colors. I think it will. Oh, yeah. Shut my mouth. Look at that. Look at that. Shut my mouth, buddy. Oh, boy. I can't believe it. Look at that. See that? Now that, that's a hole. You won't never wear out. What do you think? Does that look, does that look good? That's all mud. That's all day. That's nothing. That's no paint. That's no no paint and no nothing. That's that's all. My name on that else. Ain't that wonderful? Clyde Jones uses a chainsaw to produce the inhabitants of his wooden zoo where he lives in Bynum, North Carolina. Many self-taught artists work with used or found objects. Salvaging materials from a junkyard or trash pile is not uncommon. A lot of stuff goes in dumps to cut down wood and try to dump good wood and stuff. All kinds of vegetables and stuff can be used and try to make something out of them, stuff like that. They use artificial flowers, grapes, corks, anything we can get a hold of. People bring them in here. They go them away and recycle and bring it to me. There's so much wasted in this country. Try and make something out of it. Also using the throwaways of the world, Howard Finster built Paradise Gardens in Somerville, Georgia. The sign in his front yard states, I took the pieces you threw away and put them together by night and day, washed by rain, dried by sun, a million pieces all in one. Well, I had no material. I started off here working from the county dump. I went to the county dump and picked up beautiful pieces of glass people throw it away. House would burn and we'd go clean up the bricks and bring the bricks in here, give it to us, and we'd take and make sculpture out of them, break up the glass and stuff and use it in our walks. They laugh at me when I come here and start this garden out of the dump pile, all the scraps and junk. And I put it on there in the garden, junk can be made beautiful. And I've proved it. Purvis Young lives in the Overtown section of Miami, Florida, where he paints the problems of the world on discarded plywood. Used and found materials come to these artists with a history and life of their own. If you give me a cloth or a canvas, ideas don't pop up. Or if I see wood, sometimes wood will pop, ideas will pop. I don't know why, it just, 
you know, ideas come on wood. But uh, canvas, it just take a little time, the ideas to come. Some materials may sit in the corner of the room or side yard for years, waiting for that magic moment when it speaks to the artist and the metamorphosis from found object into art begins. Bessie Harvey looks for divine inspiration in the bent and twisted forms of tree branches and roots to create sculpture from her home in Alcoa, Tennessee. I talk to the trees through the grass and then talk to God because to me nature is God and um, I begin to see faces in the wood so that's where all these little people was coming from and sometimes I find pieces here and there uh, their guy in there called Zulu warrior I found his head about two years before I found his body Charlie Lucas wells life-size sculptures from scrap metal and engine parts, then displays them in his yard in Pink Lady, Alabama. I like wood, I like metal, I like wire, I like tin. I like anything that's frankly that man and throw it away that talks to me, and all these things talks to me. I could go and get new metal, don't get me wrong about that, but I think to put something back into a society you got to show it just in the rawness of it. And I think the ways is the rawness of us. And to me, this is what I'm trying to show, that I can recycle myself, I can recycle the material, even if it's old and rusted. I mean, even like the fuel pump. I mean, I take the fuel pump and put it into one of my little pieces and make a, a gentler heart for them to just keep on pumping, keep on pumping, even if man done throw it away and say it was worthless. I add it into a piece of my work. Some artists surround themselves with many of their artworks, forming a visual world of their own. In the spacious rural landscape of the South, they often build an environment, a sanctuary that reflects the themes and philosophy of their work. Clyde Jones has turned his entire yard into a zoo, a wooden menagerie. Visitors come seven days a week to view his armadillos, possums, porcupines, and giraffes. Though he could probably sell everything in the yard, it's not for sale. It's there for the pleasure of youngins and everyone else who ventures in. I meet so many nice people and stuff, it makes you want to do better. It makes you have a better life. Howard Finster constructed Paradise Gardens from a few small houses and a church that he acquired over the years. Every square inch is decorated with his paintings, cutouts, and discarded items that he has reshaped into what he believes are messages from God. God put me here at this particular place. And then when, he, when, he, when his Holy Spirit pled with me to put Bible verses in my garden. I didn't know what to do about it because I thought to myself, if I put Bible verses in this garden, people say I'm a fool. And then I read where the Lord said, lean not to thine own understanding. If you lack of wisdom, ask God. So that's what I've done. To pay for upkeep and management of Paradise Gardens, Howard began creating smaller, less expensive paintings and cutouts, which he sells by the thousands to visitors. I've done 29,000 900 and some paintings. I'll, in two more weeks, if I, if I get to work, I'll, I'll have about 30,000, and I don't know where I'll go to from there. Charlie Lucas lives with his family in several small houses and trailers, surrounded by metal sculptures of dinosaurs, cows, horses, people, even an airplane. This outdoor gallery is not listed in the travel guides, not marked on any road map. Some people seek it out, while others find it by accident. To some people, it's a field with scarecrows. To others, it's a museum without walls. Looking at art was just toys to me. I mean, I could come in, I could play with it. 
I could be disciplined enough to do it. I could be honest enough to be showing the pureness of me. And so to me, the whole thing is toys, that I can play with my toys and do them in a way that I don't have to worry about nobody standing over me and say, make it green, make it red, or move the arm over some. I don't, I don't even think about that no more. I feel like that they see it as a museum. I really do. I tell them I see it's a junkyard with six kids and 12 ducks and five dogs that lives here. And I say, if it enhanced your vision of looking at things, I said, come in and take a nice look at it. As an artist holds a mirror up to the world, the work of the self-taught artist reflects the scenes of nature and animal life that are part of their southern rural landscape. Like Noah's Ark, animals are everywhere, and self-taught artists use them to populate their work with humor and perception. Self-taught artists depict subjects that are autobiographical in nature, woven from their personal experience. Making mud paintings with a childlike exuberance, Jimmy Lee Sutter portrays the world around him, especially his favorite subject, himself. My name is Jimmy Lee, the famous man in the world. It's him. I, mean, I wear a red shirt. Here's a red shirt on here, just like this here. Here, this to me. Here's the mouth and everything, the, sh the shoes and everything. I'm standing there waiting for somebody to come buy some painting. This Toto, this is dog, the famous dog in the world. Toto, Toto, that left feet, wait for a biscuit and a can of me. Yeah, no, baby, all is bad. I got something in, in one of the big buildings down town. I got some of the oldest building in the world. It's a it, it really old, old building. I draw them myself. I got some of the pictures over there. Ooh, you wouldn't believe I draw them. My name's on that shoulder. I wouldn't believe myself. <laughs> used to be old railroad to go across the place. I used to go down and sit down and watch the train pass. And then get down and get on the track and draw pictures on the track. So I watch that train when it come through and I get that train. To, he come through right here and you know the use of the trains to talk when they run, you know. I think I can't I believe it will. I think I can't I believe it will. It'd be going up a hill, you know. <laughs> and I sit there and draw that train. <laughs> Y'all like that? Charlie Lucas sees himself as part of a life continuum, creating sculptures with the materials and tools of his daily job. He draws a close link between his art and his life. I was mechanic, a bootleg mechanic, shade tree mechanic, if you want to say it, but. I consider myself as a good tinker, that I can tinker with things. And my great-grandfather was a blacksmith, and during his time of living, I was always around him, and that kind of like really fascinated me, to see this iron being shaped and bent. The bicycle wheels is in the honor of my great-grandfather because he, he built wagon wheels, and I always put the the bicycle wheel there for him, for the roundness of him, the way he had shaped things, and that's for him. In the South, religion, primarily evangelical Protestantism, is more integrated into daily life than in other parts of the country. The religious imagery used by self-taught artists is a highly personalized vision of God, heaven, and hell that speaks to all audiences, no matter what their beliefs. In some sense, all self-taught artists might be described as visionary, drawing on an inner spiritual force to ignite their artistic drive. The hard life of the rural South combined with a pervasive evangelical spirit has led many self-taught artists to visualize the future home of their souls, a heavenly paradise where they will sing with the angels. A man of vision. He said in the last days, 
Old men will dream dreams, young men will dream visions, and I've had visions from three years old and dreams too. Well, I pastored churches about 40 years. I pastored 10 churches. And one night, that I'd been at a church for 15 years, and I asked them that night what I preached on that morning, and there wasn't but one man remembered my text, and it, dis it was disgusting to me. I felt like, <clears throat> you know, I wasn't getting it over to them. They forget it. And then I checked myself out to see if I forgot things, and I thought about Billy Graham, and I tried to think of one of his messages. The many years I've been hearing him, I couldn't even think of one of Billy Graham's messages he preached on. And I said to myself, we're all like that, God. I want to preach all over the world, and I ain't got enough money for one radio broadcast. So he called me into Sacred Art. And when he called me into Sacred Art, I started doing these pictures and putting my messages on there and to the world and all different kinds of messages. Sometimes I put one major message, and when I write the scriptures, I don't write them and quote them off and put you the verse. I, I write them without putting any verse on there and just like a preacher's preaching on them. There exists a comfortable marriage between Southern evangelism and African-American traditions. In African lore, where spirits and the living mingle freely, visions are accepted. The Creator done the big art. We, we are small creators. These are His hands, His eyes, and when He shows me something, it's him that see, not me. Then he uses my hands to bring it out where you can see it and others can see it. When he told the disciples to pray, our Father who, A-R-T, A-R-T in heaven, the art of heaven, see? Artists, like everyone else, are constantly bombarded with the blitz of popular culture from television, magazines, and advertisements. These images enter their art with a new twist, often using popular icons like Elvis Presley or U.S. presidents to attract our attention, while their real purpose is to deliver a message or express their most personal concerns on societal issues. They are touched and respond with the most expressive means at their disposal, their artwork. They project their cries, tears, and outrage at the unexplainable chaos of the outside world. Slavery was an integral part of Southern history, and its echoes still reverberate in the contemporary social issues of black-white relations. Bessie Harvey has produced works that reflect the loss of identity, the loss of dignity African Americans have suffered at the hands of the white man. Black people was brainwashed with whitewash, and the black man has always went around with his head down. He's always felt like he wasn't good enough to be among the rest of the people in the earth. So he made himself a horse. Ride me in any direction you want to, and I will go. When he should stand firm and say I'm a king. Living in the Overtown section of Miami, Purvis Young has seen rioting up close. He's seen boat people being turned away from a country made up of immigrants. His murals and paintings reflect masses of people struggling for life in the urban ghetto. I'm the painter, and I know the jailhouses fill up, and I paint this sometimes. You know, people, uh, uh, sometimes people don't have jobs. But see, the way I dress, I don't wear no suit. I don't wear no tent. I go listen to what the people say. If they're angry. Of all the churches they build in and Christianity, I don't see the world get no better. That's, that's my point. That's why I paint angels crying. Oh, all the Christianity, all the Bible thumping and caring, I don't see the world get no better. I'm just a painter. I forget what, what color of me. I paint white people, black people, white angels. It's the, it's, it's the way I feel. 
I'm painting a problem on the world. And when people stop marching and, and, and floods in the world and all kinds, I probably stop painting that, but that's what I'm painting in life. They are artists. Self-taught artists, self-taught Southern artists. These six artists are just a few of the many known and unknown self-taught artists who are nourished by Southern culture. Perhaps their work will prove to be the region's most significant visual artistic contribution over the past half century. Until recently, you couldn't find these untutored artists on museum walls. You had to travel down backwoods dirt roads, ask directions from the gas station or post office. And if you were lucky, you found an artist whose work was hanging on their front porch or sitting in their yards. Like all beauty, self-taught artists have always been around us. Now it's our turn to see and respond, to open our eyes and let their passionate visions enter. And when we do, we share a magic world. We too may have our own passionate visions. I never, never been in an art class in my life. Not even since I've been, everybody tell me that if I should go now, that I'd lose the gift. You know, buying new cars, I mean, I wouldn't want to do that because I think I got up one morning and got off into the spirit of doing stuff and I'd probably cut the car up and make a dinosaur or something out of it. So I'd be just wasting my time buying a new car. There ain't nothing I make it myself. It all sold, paint, scrap art, rags and everything. I could take my shorts off and paint a message on them and get a good price for them. Don't know get mad at all. Be happy all the time. And I'm, and, and, you know, I'm 83 years old and still painting. You can't believe it. This program is a partnership of the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund and the New Orleans Museum of Art based on the catalog and exhibition Passionate Visions of the American South, Self-Taught Artist from 1940 to the Present, written and curated by Alice Ray Yellen. This exhibition is sponsored by the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund, with additional funds from the Henry Luce Foundation, Incorporated. <laughs>